So you've heard a couple things. Uh, number one, he's the last one before lunch. Um, you heard he's a he, right? Uh, so uh, that, uh, that puts me in a different category. Um, but I am, uh, uh, my name is Steve Neff. I, uh, I've been with uh, Fidelity Investments for, uh, uh, for 20 years now. And um, it, is a, uh, it is a company that I will retire uh, from uh, someday. Uh, and I will not be going anywhere else because I love this company and, and part of it is because of this topic uh, today. But I did want to say a couple things up front um, because uh, I think most people have already gotten up and uh, thanked Anne and everyone who has contributed to pulling this uh, event together. Uh, it's, a, it's a really special event. But one of the things that I did uh, to get ready for this a few days ago was I went through the, uh, I went through the bios. Um, and so there were 40 some odd bios, right? And what I found was um, across many, many industries, many, many categories of industries, I found CEOs, presidents, founders, executive directors, creators, doctors, producers and directors, filmmakers, commissioners, scientists, authors, journalists, editors, strategic advisors, and two, not one, but two astrophysicists in this crew. Um, this is outstanding, uh, the, uh, the individuals who have been assembled here for this, uh, for this event, and uh, I'm kind of in awe uh, of the rest of them. Forget about me. Um, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes up front talking about fidelity, uh, and, then, um, and then the title of this, uh, this little talk is uh, Innovation Through Diversity. But there's a subtitle which says, Finding Diversity Through Innovation, uh, because I think they work hand in hand. Um, it is, uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to look out on this audience and see so many women. Uh, I've been, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a few of the forums that I belong to, but I've been um, in uh, CIO forums that don't look like this audience at all. Uh, and, that, and that's one of the things that absolutely needs to change. Um, so a little bit about, uh, a little bit about Fidelity. Uh, this is the third time today, I think, we're going to come back to 1946. Uh, so we already heard in 1946 there were three incredible women that had been doing code breaking in World War II um, and uh, were moving on to the next phase of their life. And in 1946, we heard about you know, a, another group of incredible women who were the first, really the first software developers uh, of the modern time. Um, well, also in 1946, uh, the founder of our company, uh, Edward Johnson, uh, opened up a little um, regional mutual fund company in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, and that's where our headquarters still is today. And um, the big idea that he had, the innovation that he had at the time, was think about the end of World War II and many, many families just trying to figure out how can they break into the middle class. And his concept, his idea, was essentially democratizing the whole process of investing, was bringing Wall Street to Main Street, was to make financial um, uh, information uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the ability uh, to plan your future, make it much more readily accessible to everyone. Um, and, that, uh, and that really still holds true today. Uh, since that time, uh, we're now almost 70 years later, uh, we support as a company uh, more than 25 million individual investors, uh, either as investors uh, with, uh, with a brokerage account or their individual retirement account, uh, or through the company that they work for, through uh, workplace savings type accounts or their pension systems or a whole variety of services, or through any number of financial intermediaries, registered investment advisors or banks or brokerage houses or, or the like. Um, and those companies, are there are more than 20,000 of those companies uh, and, um, and another, probably another four or five million uh, individuals that we reach that way. Um, and all of our businesses are growing, and we typically were number one, two, or three in, in all of our businesses. So what's the problem? So why do we need more innovation? Why do we need diversity in, in our company? And it's because in our industry right now, like in many other industries, we are at a point in time where the change is so different from what we've ever seen before uh, that is literally changing the underpinnings of the entire industry. And you say, well, so what kind of things are changing? Everything is changing. For us right now, the customers are changing, uh, the demographics are changing, the age is changing, uh, where the wealth is is changing, the way we interact and their expectations of a good customer experience is changing, everything is changing, who our competitors are 
uh, is changing. And the only way that we will address this and go forward and continue to be a, um, you know, a thriving company is through innovation. And we believe the only way to do that is, is through diversity. So I'm going to give you a little bit about maybe some core tenets on our, uh, our business case. So start with, um, let's start with the changing demographics. Here's some, some um, you've probably heard uh, that there, uh, there's a baby boomer generation, right? I'm part of that generation. Um, some of the baby boomers are retiring, not me, but some of the other ones are. Uh, the baby boomers are aging right now. And in fact, uh, if you look at the next decade, two-thirds of the wealth in the United States will transition to women investors. Two-thirds of the wealth will be in the hands of women investors. So you say, okay, what's the big deal? Two other statistics that we've, we've found and others have found. 70% of women investors today don't like the product that's produced by financial advisors. They don't like the product. 72% don't like the service. Okay. So they've got the money, they don't like the product, they don't like the service. Who's going to fix that problem? Right? This is like having a big leak in your, in your roof and you want to find the best auto mechanic to fix it. We need better, rep the, the design of our product in the future for women, the design of our investor centers, the design of the systems that we're going to build needs much more in the way of women, female representation. That's one little example. If you look at the millennial, uh, so this, this next generation, this is the largest generation of the millennials. And um, so we need more representation there. The, the younger generation now, the digitally aware, the digital natives, you know, half of them are in, in the room, you're part of that generation, do business totally differently uh, than we've seen in the past, right? The nature of the interaction, it's all about digital experience. Uh, it's about personalization, it's about mobile, it's about, um, we have a saying in our, in our uh, retail organization that the last best experience that you had in any form of a digital way whether that's through Amazon or Google or, or any experience, that becomes your baseline as to what's the minimal required for anything in your life. We have to be able to produce that for our customers of the future. We won't do that without appropriate representation, without enough representation. So we have a big college recruiting. I'm going to get into some of the things that, that we're doing. I'll give you a third example. And that is that uh, two and a half billion people on the face of the planet have no banking relationship today. There's probably more than half the adult population in the developing world. No banking relationship, no credit cards, no bank. Um, and so they're not customers to anybody today. So who in the audience has heard of this little technology called blockchain and Bitcoin? Right? So it's, it's a distributed ledger. Uh, it allows you, and it has a cryptocurrency that goes with it. It allows you essentially to transact business without having a trusted third party in the middle. It will someday, assuming the, the technology plays out, it will someday open up uh, this type of financial world to literally billions of people who don't have it today. How will we build that product? Who will represent those individuals without the right level of diversity in the organization? That's the third one. And the fourth one we've talked about a lot already here is the war for talent. Uh, we know that in the United States, for instance, um, this decade, we're going to produce almost one and a half million technology jobs. One and a half million. Um, we think that we'll be able to fill a third of those jobs with um, kids coming out of university in the, in the STEM program. About a third. We have to look elsewhere, right? So there's a huge shortfall uh, in talent. When you look at those four items in, in what we, we think about in our business case, as well as all the other studies that people talk about that you could reference that say diverse teams you know, are more effective, they come up with better solutions, they get there faster. There's a lot of data that, that, out there now that suggests it. There is a strong business case for diversity in, in, in our business. So, okay, what's the problem? Well, there's a bunch of problems, but there's, there are two big problems. Uh, the first one everyone in the room is very aware, aware of, which is for women and minorities, especially in STEM, um, there's not enough representation uh, in not only our industry, but technology as a whole. 
and we find that uh, we find that in every part of the world. Now, it's not it's not as bad in some parts of the world as it is in others, uh, but in the U.S. in particular, it's actually getting worse. So, just a few things: um, women uh, hold apparently 50% of the professional jobs in the U.S. 57% are women, and yet in technology, it's less than 25%. That's a big problem for us. African Americans, 3%. Hispanics, 2%. Huge problem for us. I'll give you some, so this is some recent, this is like real life recent experience for me. So we, I, I belong to uh, an organization called the Research Board. CIOs from Fortune 500 companies. There's about 100 companies in this uh, organization. We're, so we were in Chicago uh, two weeks ago, and um, there were, uh, at this particular meeting, there were 75 of us. 70 men, five women. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Of the men, there were two African Americans, there were two Hispanics. Right? It does not represent our customers, it does not represent the population of the world, it does not represent where we need to be. Yesterday, um, in, in Boston, uh, we had the Boston um, CIO Advisors uh, Group. It's a new uh, organization, with the inaugural event, and gave out uh, CIO awards uh, in New England. Uh, now, luckily there, um, there were four awards given out. One of them was given out uh, to a woman. Um, and there was a, uh, a leadership award uh, given, a, long, a lifetime leadership award in technology given out uh, to the CIO of Harvard University, who happened to be a woman. Um, and she talked for a while about the responsibility for this, this current generation of leaders to make sure that we're developing the next generation of leaders, leaders to be much more inclusive. And that's a big part of what we're trying to accomplish. So that's the problem number one is representation. Is Everybody already knew that. There's a second one, though, which is uh, how many people have been to diversity training at some point in their career? Some. Um, so one of the things you do is you bring in somebody to talk about diversity training. And that really helps, right? You give numbers or targets or whatever. It does nothing. If you, ha if you don't have a business case, um, uh, number one, you're, you're not going to do this because you're supposed to. You're not going to do it because somebody said to do it, right? You have to do it because there's a business case there. But there is an unconscious bias that many, that all of us have uh, in, a, in a variety of ways. And, it's, and really the question for, for everyone here is, where is your bias? It's a product of your upbringing, it's a product of your current situation, and, um, and, I, and I'll, I'll give you an example. I would have told you that um, I don't have any, I've never had a bias for uh, uh, people with disabilities. So I worked for the IBM Corporation in my, uh, when I started my career. And uh, I was in a branch office for a number of years and then up in a, in a headquarters site. Um, and then I got one of these development, ever get, anybody get a developmental assignment? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, developmental assignments are actually very good because they give you perspective and breadth and they get you ready for the next job, but a lot of times they suck, right? That's, that's the fact, right? They're hard jobs that need somebody to do, and they're not a permanent job. And so I was in this organization, and I was given one of these developmental assignments. The, uh, the IBM Corporation was about to go through this massive reorganization, and we had to change a lot of systems uh, to support, and we had a short period of time to do it. The guy I was working for had been a, uh, a very a senior level marketing executive um, who was struck by a neurological disease and was left as a quadriplegic in a motorized wheelchair. And, um, and I would have said, okay, I'm, not, I'm, I'm fine with that, I'm comfortable with that. I was not comfortable with that. I would go to his office and we'd sit and we'd talk. And the way he would have to drink coffee is he had partial use of his hand. So he would have to grab the cup like this and put it up like this to drink. And he would write, but it would be very, very difficult writing. It just, it made me uncomfortable. And um, so then they decided we're going to do this reorganization. And so he and I uh, had to go to, to uh, uh, Stanford, Connecticut every day for 30 days and work side by side. This is not me on a different floor, visit him, you know, every two weeks or whatever. This was side by side. So he said, so come by 7.15 on Monday morning and uh, we'll drive together. So I'm assuming I'm going to pick him up and I'm going to drive us to Stanford. So we got to his house uh, and I said, you want to get my... He said, no, I'm driving. I said, oh, okay. 
So he came out in the wheelchair. We got to his car. He opened the door. He had one of these three-foot boards, right, that he would slide under his butt and come up to the car and then slide himself across into the driver's seat. He had a handbrake. He had an accelerator, a uh, hand accelerator. And he drove us to Stanford. He did that for one month. And we, like, almost lived together, you know, six, ten hours every single day. By the time that experience uh, was over for me, when you talk about leadership qualities, I'm going to confuse who talked about what, but we, we did talk about leadership qualities. And, and I wrote some of them down because I thought of this guy. I think it was Margaret um, from Intel. I wrote down commitment. I wrote down inspiration. I wrote down decisiveness. I wrote down honesty, confidence, tenacity. That was this guy. He didn't teach me anything about technology. He didn't teach me anything about how to do a program management job. He didn't teach me how to about what he, he taught me leadership. He taught me those things over that one month. And it's an experience that, um, that to this day has, has me think very differently about this topic. Now, you can say that to people. Um, you can talk about unconscious bias, but it's really good when you can actually test it. So um, we did some diversity training about six months ago with a lot of the leadership team in, in technology. And uh, the difference, though, was we had uh, the, the guy who came in uh, referred to um, uh, Project Implicit. This was, this was a study that was done I know, 10 years ago, Harvard, um, uh, University of Virginia, I think University of, of Washington. Um, and it is a, uh, so it's what's below the surface. What is the bias that's there that's the natural instinct that you don't even think about? And they developed this whole series of tests. And you can go online, you can Google Project Implicit. There's a, there's a nice uh, uh, eight or ten minute video that Alan Alda does where he talks about the, uh, the, prof the, uh, the, the uh, professor at, uh, uh, at Harvard. And you can do these tests. You can actually see for yourself, and you can do them over and over again. There's one for gender, there's one for race, there's one for skin color, there's one for age, there's one for disabilities. I've taken about half of them so far. Um, it's very different. So it's, it's almost like experiential learning versus just watching the PowerPoints that are gone. We need to do more things like that on that kind of a topic. So those are the two big problems. But I think the other thing is, so it's how do you find diversity through innovation? And um, I just want to talk about a few, a few of the things uh, that we're doing. And when I say we, this is the whole uh, Fidelity Corporation. You had John up here uh, earlier, who's, uh, who's really a, a great champion in the company. Uh, we have a lot of people here from uh, our global business uh, uh, services team, technology and, and business operations from, uh, from Ireland. I didn't, uh, I didn't say, by the way, that uh, Fidelity in Ireland is now up over 700 people in, uh, in Dublin and Galway. Uh, and so it's a, uh, it's a great part of the world, and um, we're really, the talent we have found here has been phenomenal. So start with, uh, we start with the next generation. So we have, been, we have been much more effective at finding diversity and finding women uh, coming out of university on a global basis. And we're going to hire probably 600 uh, grads a year now going forward. Uh, the population, the, the percentage of women in the U.S. is probably up over 30% now finally of who we're able to attract, even though the participation rates are below, they're down around 14% of the U.S. So you, have to, you have to look, you have to look hard. But there, it's one thing uh, to have more diversity, but in, the inclusion is the other half, right? So we use the, uh, this uh, po population of incoming uh, university graduates, we call it our, our LEAP program. And uh, we use them for designing the space. We use them for what collaboration should look like. We use them for what, uh, how, how systems should be, should be built. We use them to mentor the senior executives of the company. So this happened a couple of years ago. I, uh, I, have, I have some kids who are millennials. And I was home at night um, and having a conversation with one of my daughters. And we were in the process of rolling out a pretty broad-based video conferencing set of, uh, systems in, in the company, desktop video. Um, room video systems globally, and I, so I was telling her about this, and she said, uh, oh yeah, that's like, that's like Google Hangout. To which I said, dumb move, to which I said, oh, what's that? <laughs> and she said, Dad, you run technology and you don't know anything about it? And I realized that 
I am at the other end of the spectrum at this point, and there's stuff changing pretty rapidly, and so we instituted this program where a lot of the more senior leadership who aren't maybe as close to the details are now doing one-on-ones with millennials to find out how they use technology, and a lot of other things, by the way. Uh, we've got about, about 28 in the program right now. So it's, a, it's, a little, it's a little piece of innovation. It's kind of a process. It's a people-oriented uh, innovation. Um, we talked about, um, I, I, I didn't hear the whole conversation before this, the, uh, but we talked about women who um, go off on maternity leave and then come back to work. Uh, that's one way uh, that women come back. A lot of times women don't come back. Uh, and in fact, women leave technology in the middle of their career, uh, and they either do one or two things from what I've seen. They either go to a different career because they don't like technology because it's not supportive enough for them, so they go do something else, or they go raise a family uh, and never come back. But a lot of them want to come back. They have no way of getting back in. It's a hard barrier uh, to, uh, to, to get over. And so we found a company in, uh, uh, in Boston, in the US, uh, and actually uh, our, the head of our, our global uh, team has found a company in, uh, in India, and we're doing the same thing, is we're finding women uh, who would like to re-enter the workforce, putting them through a training program, getting them internships in the company, and either finding them a permanent position uh, or, worst case, they now have a current resume and they can get back into the workforce for, for another company. Um, just another little example. I could go on with, with a, a lot more. There's, there, uh, there is a, um, uh, there's something called Mass Challenge in Boston right now. It's an incubator startup program accelerator funding for, uh, uh, for uh, VCs, uh, for a VC type funding for uh, startups. Um, uh, so we've been heavy participants in that. Uh, this last set of startups, 40% um, of the startups had at least one woman owner, uh, a founder uh, of the company. That's twice what it was last year. You have, there are gold nuggets everywhere. So I, I would leave this, um, this section with really, with really four points. Um, point number one is there really is a strong business case for diversity. You have to look for it. And if you don't have one, don't expect that it's going to happen because it's not going to happen in your company. The second thing is to be aware uh, and actually embrace the fact that these bias exist. Try to get to understand what your bias is. Try to work around it to the extent that you, that, that you might have some or, the, or that the managers who work for you may have it. Uh, the third thing is just by using the traditional approaches, it won't work, right? We're not going to find diversity just by saying, we're going to take the pool that's out there and we're all going to fight over that pool. And maybe I'm going to win or maybe you're going to win. We need a larger pool. And the last thing is to think about this topic this way, is we need diversity to drive innovation, but we have to use innovation to find diversity. So thank you.